materials in the PowerPoint will stay up afterwards, but the other ones are not. Would you replace them with links so that we can find them if we want? Okay, uh, no. Okay. Some yeah, of them, nice. they're, you know, like in JSTOR and stuff, you know what I mean? So that one, you just, if you have the citation, the citations are in the slides, so you Perfect. can go through your own library's portal and get them. Perfect. The only one that's like super, super hard to get is the Tanner metacognition thing. That's up. Uh, college biology teacher and there's some kind of journal for teaching in college biology classes that's not in all the standard databases. The other ones you would be able to get. of computational thinking, computational thinking. Yeah. How would you define it? Oh. Uh, what does it mean to you? Logic-driven? Do you work with people who are like computer scientists? No, no, no. I, um, I have a background in K-12. Oh, do they talk about that in K-12? I only know it from somebody who teaches engineering at a college. Oh, oh, oh. Well, I mean, this is just kind of uh, offhand and kind of uh, my undergraduate area. It's been kind of a while since I've thought about it. Uh, so, so the term might have a much broader use than I'm familiar with, because I'm familiar with the computer science college level. That's useful to me. Should we go ahead and should we go ahead and start? People are still trickling in. Okay. Uh, oh no, I already did that. I don't need to do that. Sorry. Here we go. Okay. So 
Um, okay, so I have to say I'm like absolutely thrilled. I'm, you just can't even imagine how thrilled I am to see you here. Um, because I often feel like I'm all alone. Um, <laughs> uh, so, so after University of Washington Law School Administration discovered that I was conducting an experiment to try and get all the students in my first year contracts class performing at an A level, do you know what the institutional response was? I don't teach first year contracts anymore. Okay. So, so, uh, so I've had trouble finding, you know, colleagues that want to engage with me. Anyway, um, okay, so I'm going to start out. One day when I was having a particularly bad day, I wrote a rant, which is a parable, um, and I'll just share that with you very briefly. Now, I'm guessing, because you've come to the Cali conference and you've come to this talk, that a lot of the information that I'm going to cover, a lot of you are already familiar with it, but because we can't be sure who knows what, I'm just going to cover some of the super basic stuff. The, the rubrics part comes with basic operations of legal reasoning. That's when we transition from background information to my, what I'm working on. And then the next ones are moving forward. OK, so here's the parable. So, so what would you think if you heard that there was a public school district that modified its middle school, high school math curriculum? As far as I know, it's pretty standard. There's a lot of work on, on math curriculum and teaching math. And it's pretty standardized in the United States, and I've even asked international students, it's pretty standard in foreign countries, that there's some kind of sequence that's something like start with algebra, then geometry, then something, different things follow, but some people do trigonometry, and then pre-calculus and calculus if you're staying on the sequence. So let's just say that's a pretty standard progression. And what if there was a school district that just decided they were going to eliminate algebra, geometry and trigonometry, and instead they were going to replace in the, in the uh, middle school, high school curriculum years and years of pre-calculus followed by calculus. What would you expect would be the result? A lot of resistance. Uh, right, but let's just say, let's just say that, the, okay, so the resistance might take the form of families with money might hire private tutors for their kids, Sure. right? If that's, if that's what the public schools are providing, some people are going to opt out, right? Um, and some people are going to just have an innate gift. Math is something that you can have an innate gift for, unlike a lot of things. So some people will sail through. They can intuit what algebra would have been without being told. But if you had a system where people were just exposed to pre-calculus problems over and over again, and then calculus problems and whether or not they could go to university was based on whether or not they could solve those problems, what you'd get is you'd get people that could reproduce a particular solution to a particular problem, but they wouldn't actually understand the theory unless somehow they got private tuition outside of the system for most people. Okay, so, so this is obviously my metaphor for what I think is going on in the JD curriculum. I think we start with pre-calculus, and we just repeat it over and over again. If you know anything about information theory and Claude Shannon, there's different ways to compensate for a weak signal. One of them is amplify the signal. Another one is just repeat the weak signal over and over. That's what we do in law school. We send a weak signal over and over for three years. Okay, so, so this is my frustration is I think what we're missing is algebra, geometry, and trigonometry. And so it's like little red hand. It's like, well, okay, if it's not out there, then let's try and build it. Okay, so, so the, the framework within which I'm trying to do this, I found this book, How People Learn, which was published by the National Academies Press, to be super, super helpful. It's a generic, plain vanilla, basic introduction to learning theory, you know, circa 2000. It's, it's available in the public domain. So I put chapter two on experts versus novice up on the website. Um, so, so part of that is to, to help students, you need to sequence things. And I would say, you know, put the elementary basic things first, and then, you know, more complex synthetic concepts come second. And as far as I know, you know, I haven't done an in-depth study of every single subject in American higher education, but as far as I know, law is really, really relatively unique in not having a standard consensus version of the sequencing. What we have is we have first year contract, you know, first year, you know, normally covers contracts, property, tort, civil procedure stuff, and then the upper level you have to take professional responsibility, and now we've got these standards about experiential learning. So what I'm suggesting is that's equivalent to saying, but of course we have a sequence. We start with pre-calculus and then we go to calculus. That it's just not granular enough. Um, so uh, transfer 
is I think, so I sort of backed into this, I think the core of what I'm trying to suggest is that we could make transfer a lot more explicit. Because if you sit down and just chat informally with students in the first year of the law school curriculum, most of them cannot see the connection between Socratic style class discussion and what is tested on the exam. Now, to the expert, the instructor, the connection is clear, but we don't make it explicit. So one way to facilitate transfer from one context to another is reduce the jump. Just get them closer and closer. So the experiments I've been conducting, I've been teaching undergraduates how to do issue spotter exams. And so what I do is I have super, super simple, clear, modern, short cases, and we brief the case, and then when we've got the issue statement from the case, I have a, a matching issue spotter exam, and on the board in class, we port the issue statement from the case to the issue spotter. That's the first draft of the I and I rec, over and over and over again. Okay, so I got some students at University of Washington, granted they were the more capable ones, I got students at the University of Washington to outperform my 1L JD students on their first set of exams. And they only had a three credit undergraduate course, and all we did was we brief cases, practice issue spotter, brief cases, practice issue spotter, and then the fact patterns they saw were new. It was critical thinking. You can't memorize the answer to an issue spotter exam you haven't seen, right? So it was tightly constrained. I only taught them, get this, I only taught them what is an offer. That's it. They only had one black letter law rule. It's got several branches, but they didn't even have what is acceptance, right? So we constrain the amount of rules we teach, and, we, and I focused on apply. So, so why is transfer relevant? So I'm not an expert on learning theory, but I think when you're doing assessment, you have to articulate what the relationship is between the concrete proxy that you're assessing and the underlying cognitive function that's the goal. Right? So, so transfer is a key, whoops, gosh. Transfer is a key thing that you can assess in formative and summative assessment as a, as a measure of the underlying mastery that you can't measure directly. Um, so scaffolding. One of the most common responses I get when I try and tell people what I'm doing is that it's like, well, that's like not real legal reasoning. It's like, sure. And riding a bicycle with training wheels is not really riding a bicycle. So all I'm proposing is scaffolding. That's all I'm proposing. And then like we can throw it away. It could be maybe a one week orientation at the beginning of law school and then leave the rest of the law school curriculum unchanged. It's just scaffolding. I'm not proposing this as a fundamental reform to JD curriculum. And then finally, breaking things down into chunks and making them modular in terms of cognitive function makes it easier to pull things from long-term memory into short-term memory or to store them. So chunking the way that information is presented and making it modular so you can see how it fits helps students to uh, remember what they've learned. So those are the kind of, and I'm guessing, in, now let, just as a show of hands, how many people in this room think they're already doing all that stuff? Yeah, so some, right? Do you see what I mean? It's like people are familiar with these concepts and, and they've been trying to implement them. So there should be like a community of, you know, sharing or collaboration or something. So anyway, okay. Um, okay, so the chapter from the National Academies Press is Expert versus Novice. How many people have come across Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow? If you haven't, it's a hoot. You need to read it. How many people know that Malcolm Gladwell wrote a book called Blink or something? Okay, Kahneman's ideas were the basis for that book, and I think he got hacked off that Gladwell was making millions of dollars mischaracterizing and describing his research incorrectly, right? So just, the Kahneman book is just as fun as Gladwell, and it's actually the guy who invented it. Okay, so, so experts are not conscious of the steps in their reasoning process because as they go practice over and over again, they begin to collapse the steps, and they experience the, sol they experience the solution as perceiving the solution. They don't experience themselves as abstracting and inferring the different steps. By contrast, novices are condemned to think slowly. They must mechanically be trained to abstract. They must mechanically be trained what inferences to draw. Now, Gladwell talks a lot about the 10,000 times, you do something 10,000 times to get from expert to novice, which is like, that's fine. You know, that's, it's, not, it's not as deep a thought as it might be, but it's, it's a pretty good rule of thumb. Um, now, the problem is that it's not 10,000 times just mechanically repeating something. You have to actually know what the target is, and you, every time you do it, you assess how close you got to the target. 
So the 10,000 times of practice flat out accomplishes nothing if you don't understand the target. So that's why I'm saying we need to switch from osmotic transmission of you know, tacit knowledge to being completely transparent. Now, James Sirwicky is the economics correspondent at the New York Times, and he wrote like a fabulous article about targeted practice and all that. And he points out that performance uh, <coughs> skills like sports and music have been completely transformed over the last 25 years. And at the end, there's a sort of plaintive comment, which is like, in, and why do we see so little of this in formal education? And I would say, if you talk to our colleagues outside legal education, they're a little bit more with the program than we are. So law is kind of a black hole where we're not, we're not explicitly, formally, uh, institutionally, as a community, embracing the idea. Um, OK, so how many people know about Bartlett and the War of the Ghosts? OK, I didn't put the PowerPoint in because it's a little bit digressive. So Bartlett was like an ethnographer, and he told a bunch of English people in the 1930s a very bizarre story from the Inuit about people went off to make war on another village, and one of them was killed. And then he went back to his own village, and he was talking to people, and then he fell down. So they, he told them this, you know, an ethnographer had transcribed this folk tale. And he told the English people, and then he came back a day later, and he asked them, what they remembered. And so people remembered that there had been a provocation to justify the war on the other village. People remembered that their surname was Ghost, because they couldn't get how he could be dead and go back to his village and talk to people, right? So what, what Bartlett realized was they were invoking English 1930s social schemas to make sense of this story that just on its face is just flat out illogical and incomprehensible to someone living in England, right? So, so if you'd search for War of the Ghosts on the internet or email me, I can tell you the, send you a description of the War of the Ghosts. It's pretty hilarious. Okay. So, so, um, so a schema is something that you invoke, right? So for example, if I was to stop talking right now and start eating my lunch, everybody in the room would think like, that's like really like so not appropriate, right? Because we all have schemas about what people who are giving PowerPoint presentations are supposed to do and not do, right? So that would be a violation of everyone's collective understanding. So what a schema is, is it gives you information, it gives you a way to organize new information, you put it in a filing cabinet. So everybody has schemas, nobody by the time they come to law school is learning new. The schema that they've determined that infants have is there's an experiment they can do where they, they get the pupils, just like the eye doctor focuses on light refraction in your pupils, so they can tell whether your pupils are dilating or moving. Right, so they've got an infant who's like three weeks old, can't speak, can't wave, you know, communicate. And they show the infant an object moving off a surface and falling, and an object moving off the surface and hanging in space. And at three weeks old, the, in, the infant knows that it's not supposed to hang in space. The infant has already learned that when it leaves the edge of the table, it should fall. So that's, that's they prove that infants have schemas at three weeks old. No one comes to law school with a blank slate. So what do we talk about at law school? We say thinking like a lawyer. It's a complex matrix of schemas, and we keep dumping it on people as a complex matrix of schemas, and we say it's your responsibility to unbundle them. OK, now, apparently, so I read randomly in other literatures, David Osubel was one of the founders of the reform of science teaching in like K-12, and he said, the key, nobody, even small children don't learn science in the abstract. In the, in the uh, how people learn book, one of their examples is uh, in, in Anglo-American majority families, it's very common to eat pumpkin pie for Thanksgiving. But in African-American families, they don't eat pumpkin pie. They eat sweet potato pie. And so if the teacher knows that, when they're talking about pumpkin pie, like divide the pumpkin pie into six parts for fractions and put two, right? The, the African American kids are trying to figure out how you fit a pumpkin into a pod. <laughs> They're not listening to the explanation about fractions. So if the teacher just says, pumpkin pie is what white folks eat instead of sweet potato pie, then they can focus on the fractions because they get over that distraction, right? Okay, so, so they've made huge, huge, there's an entire academic literature in science education about how people literally don't understand what their science teacher is saying and they learn it wrong and they reproduce it on tests, they memorize the words without understanding the theory. Okay, so so teach accordingly means you have to you have to figure out what 
when, when I say that's subjective intent rather than objective intent, I, I've discovered like a huge number of students have them 180 degrees reversed, which is like, that's okay because I took economics as an undergraduate. Marxists would say that price is subjective and neoclassical economists would say it's objective, right? So, so, so you have to find out how the student is responding and then you have to figure out the transition path between what they're doing and the end game, which is thinking like a lawyer. Okay, so that's the problem that I've been working on. And what I came up with is, for lack of anything better to call it, I call it basic operations of legal reasoning. If somebody has a better idea, I'm thrilled. It's like addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division are basic operations of math. So when I teach like these undergraduates how to take issue spotter exams, the first thing we do is rules can be understood as if-then statements. If is the fractional predicate that defines the scope of the application of the rule, then is the consequence. And we practice converting speed limit 60 miles an hour means if driving, uh, then don't exceed 60, you know, switching from the way that they're conventionally described into their logical structure. Uh, facts, key facts are outcome determinative facts, spin facts are irrelevant facts that distort your perception by, by um, invoking emotional responses. So there's a guy named Ira Shafiroff who teaches at California Western. Anyway, it's one, it's one of the law schools either in Los Angeles or South, Cal Western or, South, or Southwestern. Sorry, I forget. Okay. Anyway, so he has an example, which is there's a famous case, I don't know what class it's taught in, where some guy was convicted of a crime of like exposing himself on the street. And it was overturned on appeal. Does this sound familiar for criminal law teachers? It was overturned on appeal. And the first paragraph of the, of the decision on appeal is defendant a decorated World War II veteran. Right? It's like that spin. It doesn't have anything to do with whether he exposed himself, right? Okay. But you can tell once you once you read that first paragraph, you know how that appeal is going to turn out, right? Okay. Um, now, Toolman, Stephen Toolman talks about warrants. Of all these things that I got up here, the hardest one is apply. It's like I'm just like, you know, struggling. It's like I haven't got a clue how we're going to describe that. So I'm trying to break down the process of apply the rules to the facts. So one of the things I'm doing is is I'm trying to color rules in red and facts in blue and mixed questions where you've got facts and rules mixed together as purple so the students can see mechanically in each sentence what it is that they're doing. Um, now, apparently, for those of you who are legal writing instructors, is there a big controversy about under does when versus whether when? Is that my colleagues at UW told me that's a big controversy. Under does when is apparently leading now and whether when is considered old fashioned. Just as a mechanical formula for teaching students to plug in some of the issue statement has to have ruley parts, some of the issue statement has to have facty parts, and then some of it is mixed, okay? So we're, we're being very <coughs> explicit and self-conscious about linguistically what we're constructing in the issue statement. Now, here's the punchline. So far, I feel pretty confident none of the students ever got it, but I've been working on this for several years. You want to hear the punchline? Okay, so, so first of all, when we write legal reasoning, it is not presented as circular, but it is actually circular, okay? And the way that we explain the circularity is that all rules in law have facts embedded in them. That's the scope, that's the if. Now, all facts have rules is a little bit less obvious, but the point is that the only facts we care about are the outcome determinative ones. How do you know it's outcome determinative? With reference to the scope of a rule, okay? so. The actual thing that we're teaching in law school is circular. It is. Now, in fact, as a social practice, it's not indeterminate. It's not indeterminate because analogical reasoning and moving back and forth between the rule fact distinction is where we do all the work. So most of this is background, and then this ultimately is the thinking like a lawyer piece that, that I believe can be made completely transparent. Now, finally, ultimately, ultimately, there is a piece of legal reasoning that cannot be made absolutely explicit and transparent. What is that? The state has a monopoly on violence. Law is the exercise of power, and it's often exercised in illegitimate ways. That's the radioactive core that we can't make completely transparent. Every person in society comes to their own understanding about what power is legitimate and illegitimate. But I promise you, we can get like 98% absolutely explicit and transparent.
transparent. And then what would happen is those, those social practices about the legitimate exercise of power would also be transparent. Like, where does that get you? Last time I checked, that's called democracy. OK. So, so you can t that doesn't bother me. A lot of people find that very disturbing. OK, so, okay, so I've been working with this thing now. A couple of years ago at a Cali conference, a guy named Keith, Kevin Ashley from the University of Pittsburgh came. Does anybody remember that? He talked about the software program. OK, so for the last decade, the University of Pittsburgh the STEM teachers, like the in-the-classroom STEM teachers, have been collaborating with the machine learning, artificial intelligence research people, and they came up with this software system that gives you very powerful analytic tools for seeing how students give each other peer feedback. And uh, the goal was to teach STEM students to write better. So apparently, in, in computer learning, that's called a wicked problem. There's tame problems and there's wicked problems. Okay, so they said, okay, so we're gonna we're gonna take on the hard one, which is the wicked problem. Okay, now the faculty member has to develop a rubric, and then students go online and they give feedback to five other students anonymously, applying the instructor's rubrics. There's two parts. You give a score of one to seven. Seven is the best, and then you write a text comment. Now the research result that they got, which is very strong, is in terms of like they're much better at the math than I am, but. If students feed, give feedback to one or two other students, it's like, that's fine. Three or four are better. If they give up to five and the rubric is correctly designed, then the student feedback becomes statistically indistinguishable from the instructor feedback. So does everybody see? So what are we supposed to be talking about? We're supposed to be talking about formative assessment, right? Do you see how that's just like, woo, takes a huge weight off the instructor. All, it's all front-end loaded. You build the rubric, and then you empower the students to internalize the knowledge and give each other feedback. And they've interviewed students that have done this, and it's like, yeah, I find the feedback from the other students at least as helpful as the instructor. We don't have to privilege what the instructor is doing. Does that make sense? It's like, of course the instructor is free to continue to give feedback, and of course the student is going to distinguish. But remember, the student is in the process of, of like surrendering inappropriate schemas and building explicit schemas. And there's a principle. Do you know the principle? Like, like people at the same level of knowledge, can, it's like it's easier to transmit knowledge to each other. It's like, I can't, OK, there was a thing in the New York Times or a long time ago where they had these little kids in daycare. And it was like Minnesota. It was really cold. So these little toddlers, like 18 months to two years old, can you imagine the poor daycare teachers? Little snow pants. So that you got like 20 little toddlers all in there, and they're all in a row, all ready to go outside, and you know the little toddlers taught each other how to take off their hats. <laughs> right? So you look down, it's like, shoot, their hats are all off, right? It's like, we know the teacher didn't teach them that, right? So that's the principle that, that this dialogue between the students, even if the other student says something wrong, when the student who receives that feedback thinks about it, that's part of the process for them. Okay, so anyway, so I think like perceptive is like completely amazing. Okay, so what are the preliminary results? So a year ago, so I taught sales. Now we got a thing going on at UW Law School, I don't know. How many people think like, whoa, how can you only have 12 students in sales? I don't know, we got too many human rights courses. Okay, so, <laughs> okay, so I only had 12 students. Okay, so I just did the ordinary exam. Now, I had been practicing with my JD1L students on, on improving the way that they composed the ERAC answers. Now, that doesn't solve the issue spotting problem. Issue spotting is one order of magnitude harder than composing a coherent ERAC essay. But, but you know, composing a, a, a coherent ERAC essay is an important skill, right? So after I taught my JD1Ls how to write like reasonably coherent uh, skills, and then was fired from teaching first year contracts for doing that, um, then I taught my two and three L sales law students. And when I read their exams, I was, I was just appalled that like fully half the students, their, their exam answers were less coherent than my 1L first year contract students after I'd been practicing with my, right? I just thought, oh, what, what are we doing? It's just social promotion. We're just, we're just letting people get through. It's just, I, I was just appalled. Okay, so the next year I came in, I thought, ha, I've learned to use perceptive. Oh, so, so we went through two complete perceptive cycles. They were given an issue spotter question, 
They were required to write in an IRAC classic issue spot or form, and then they gave feedback to five students. We did two complete cycles of that. Now, when I was reading the exam answers, boy, it was jumping off the page at me that they were like way more coherent. Their issue spotting accuracy wasn't significantly better, but, but the, the structure of the answers seemed better. So, so I'm still trying to find somebody who's better at statistics than I am to tell me whether this is statistically you know, significant. What problems are there with this like incredibly tentative preliminary outcome? The problems are students were not assigned randomly to be in sales. I could have gotten a load of dummies the first year and all law review the second year, we don't know. Uh, I could have accidentally made the questions harder. I could have accidentally changed the way I graded them. You know, so I was doing my best, but you know, it was like, this is super, super, super tentative. But, but it validates what I experienced looking at what they wrote, which is that what they wrote looked better to me. Not the, not the content of the, the rule that they were applying, but the overall framework of the analysis. Okay, so now my new hobby is I want to do a randomized control testing of old and new teaching methods in legal education. So I came up with this idea. What if you had just one day in orientation? So all law schools have some kind of orientation. So, you know, find room for like one day. So in one day, take a few doctrines from agency law. Now, how many people know that 50 or 60 years ago, agency law was a mandatory 1L course in most American law schools? Yeah, and it's, and it's not there anymore. So you wouldn't have any turf battles. You wouldn't have, it's like, I don't give them permission to teach my subject that way, right? Okay, so, so it's only taught in upper level organization, you know, biz orgs, right? Okay, take three or four tort, uh, agency law doctrines have students practice briefing cases, and then give them a second case, break out discussion, discuss briefing cases, then give them an ear rack on exactly the same issue as the case, and then give them a second ear rack, break out discussion groups, discuss it, then uh, come back in the afternoon, talk about outlining. Now, do you want to hear? Okay, so I started teaching in 1989. So I've been teaching like 25 years, and it wasn't until two years ago that I ever looked at a student's outline. So I invited students to come to my office with their midterm exams and their outline, and we would look at the questions that they screwed up, and we would see what was missing from their outline, right? In 25 years of teaching, I never did that. That's a hell of an indictment of me as a person, but there you have it. Okay, at least I figured out that I'm a bad person. Okay, so, so what did I discover? It's like, I don't know about you guys, but all my students were just outlining the black letter law rules, like in the Barbary outline books, right? Okay, so how to explain to students the bridging so that they can do the analogical reasoning. You want to hear what I came up with? Have you looked at the comments of restatements? Restatements reporters are required to give plain vanilla, squarely in the scope of the rule, squarely outside of the scope of the rule, fact patterns, and explain it like it's sort of like the sixth grade reading level. That's actually the comments to like restatement of contracts, restatement of torts. So my system for teaching outlines now is to make students write outlines that look like the comments to the restatement of torts, you know, at a very abstract level. Okay, and then the final, so four segments, the final one is a quick repeat of everything, which would be briefing, ERAC, outline, okay? So if you had four teachers, two sections, randomly assigned students to, the, the control section is best practices from legal writing. Best practices from bar review. That's, we'll call that sort of like the classic contemporary approach. And then the other one is my basic operations of legal reasoning, rules, if then, key, you know, facts, that kind of stuff. Um, so the content would be exactly the same. The cases would be the same. The exams would be the same. The black letter law would be the same. The only difference would be how they present that material. Uh, and there'd be four teachers. All four teachers would be trained in both methods and they'd cycle through. So you would, every student would have been exposed to all four teachers. You couldn't say like, well, one teacher was better, right? You know, nobody you would, you'd control for that, right? And then you would test their comprehension of basic legal reasoning after one day, three months, and six months. So I came up with that. So I don't know, I mean, I talked to a few people, they said like, yeah, I, I, that's probably a valid research design. So, um, so it's gonna to apply to the access group. How many people know about the access group? You know, the access group has like boatloads of money. It's sitting on boatloads of money. Okay, so for those of you who don't know this, access group used to be a student lender, biggest legal education student lender. Obama said no more private student lending. It's a nonprofit. Every month, repayments are piling up. And what shall we do with them? Because they can't lend them, right? So um, they're giving them out as research grants to improve two things, student understanding of lending 
like when they borrow the loans and repay the loans, like how they understand what they're doing. And the other one is to reform legal education. So it's like if you go onto their website, it's called Unsolicited Grants Program, and they've got like they've already funded like 30 projects, and it's like like a huge array of things, right? So that's what I was gonna do. <coughs> okay, so told me I couldn't. So if anybody wants to do this, I'd be happy to any law school in America, I'd be thrilled to collaborate with you. Okay, so I'm, it's like, oh well, never mind. Um, <laughs> okay, so um, so what's going on here? Okay, so I mean, I don't know if that strikes you as a surprising outcome. My dean told me I wasn't even allowed to apply for funding to have one day in orientation. It's like, okay. Uh, so what's that about? Okay, so I think this is an article I found. One of, one of my hobbies is doing research on diffusion of innovation because let me tell you, the barriers to diffusion of innovation in legal education are really, really scary. Okay, and okay, so my other research topic is e commerce. Okay, so I can explain to you about Uber and Bitcoin and all those like 21st century business models. Okay, so, so that's what I study in the real world, and then I come back to my law school and I think, you know, I just don't have the psychological energy to debate how many angels can dance on the head of a pin, right? It's like why people don't share a sense of urgency is like, I can, I can tell you why, because it's a state-sanctioned cartel. The only reason that legal education is allowed to continue in its current form is that we have a cartel. The minute that cartel breaks, it's like going to be like a house of cards. Now, so the only interesting question is, is if and when the cartel will break. So people are placing different bets on that. When I'm obviously placing a bet on the idea that the crisis in legal education, if it continues unabated, then at some point they're going to authorize like conventional competition, that law schools would actually face sort of competition in the conventional sense. Um, so, so what we have right now is we have a situation where there's, it's, the, the current structure of legal education is fraught with principal agent conflicts, like just layers and layers of principal agent conflicts between the who's, the, who's the agent? Well, I think it's the citizens of the United States. It's the subjects of the legal system, right? But you could also say, it's the law firm, so you could say it's the law students, whatever. Choose whatever you want to be the agent. The faculty are supposed to be serving those agents, and they're just, they're just, uh, what do they call it in economics? What does the agent do? It's like it goes on a frolic. Anyway, okay, so the, the faculty are frolicking. Now, so people in the American Bar Association, there's people in the American Bar Association that feel very, very worried, right? That's why they have that new formative assessment thing. Right? Now, maybe the majority of law faculty don't get it, but there's some people in the ADA who get it, right? And there's some people in legal education who get it. Okay, so let's go ahead and say that there's a practice that is supposed to change, which is like formative assessment, okay? So, so uh, conscious levels of reflection during the implementation. What these business school professors discover is that if the leadership of the organization says, this is not so profoundly different to what you're already doing. And people don't have a sense of cognitive dissonance and having to change and, and you know, Kubler-Ross, you know, like denial, anger, bargaining, grief, right? If they don't go through that, then um, if they have low level of conscious reflection and they don't fundamentally believe in it, then you get stonewalling, right? How many people believe that the majority of American law school professors are now looking at the ABA formative assessment requirements to see how they can describe what they have always done using the vocabulary of the standards so that they don't have to change anything. That's my personal intuition about the majority of law faculty. That is intentional decoupling. The ABA says we need to get with the formative assessment program and the subtext is because if that cartel is ever broken, we're toast, right? And the faculty are just in denial. It's like, but, but the cartel will never break. Okay, so uh, unintentional decoupling is people of goodwill who, who support the practice, but they just don't get it, okay? So, so yeah, so that's, I think, I think Lots and lots and lots of people, particularly in the experiential learning, legal writing, clinical section 
are in that section. And I think that, that we can all like collaborate and empower ourselves. I'm suggesting that the way to break out of this, the, to break out of the low rate of innovation, the low rate of institutional transformation, I think that basic operations of legal reasoning would help break that log jam. That if we could come together and start debating, like my ideas are like Jay wins half-baked first draft of a description. That's all it is. It's like I don't I don't presume to be able to distill the essence of the legal system down to like clear, transparent units, right? But I believe that the American Legal Academy as a community has the collective knowledge to do that. And I explain it to people, and I think like, what could be more exciting? And then it's like, oh, I'm sorry, I have to leave. And the discussion ends. Okay. So I haven't been a good evangelist. I haven't convinced people that there's nothing more interesting as a research project or fun as a hobby than trying to get through to this, this lower level of concepts. OK, so my background, like I said, is in e-commerce. And if you hang out with information economy people, there's a little mantra, which is called standards build markets. If you want to diffuse innovation quickly and effectively, it needs to be standardized. That would be the restatement of contracts, the restatement of torts. Those are standards, right? So if we had like super standardized descriptions of these super low-level modular algebra and geometry equivalent before you come to reasoning about cases, if we could standardize that, what would happen? It would promote student metacognition. When you said to a student, look, here, you've only got rules, and this part of your analysis needs to mix rules and facts with a warrant, they would say, oh, I see. If you had trained them in the vocabulary of the standard, so that the torts teacher and the contracts teacher and the civil procedure teacher would give feedback on their formative assessment using the same words so the students could internalize it and apply it themselves and could talk to each other without giving this information, right? It would promote student metacognition and like, whoa, I'm not that good at, I don't, I don't code. I'm not, I'm not a software person. I have a college degree in economics. But it's like, if we had these standardized modules, the ability to start using smart systems increases enormously, okay? Uh, so, now, so, so, okay, so here I'll tell you another one of my little crackpot theories, which is how many people know that there's a legal profession in the United States that's growing exponentially called compliance? Do people know that? Okay, so here's a data point. My background is in financial services. And I have a friend who used to be a bank lawyer at Bank of America, and then she got laid off, and then she worked like, PayPal, she's my age, and it's like, she quit. It's like, no, I'm sorry, I can't take it. Okay, so, so as, as she was leaving, she said, she heard Western Union had 800 compliance staff. They've increased that to 2,400. It is the largest department at Western Union. How many people know that BNP was fined $9 billion for anti-money laundering, right? Do you see what I mean? It's like, it's like this profession called compliance, it's called GRC, Governance, Risk Management, and Compliance. It's growing exponentially. As far as I can tell, every JD required job that dies and is stuffed out is replaced by at least one compliance job, right? And law students are so stupid. It's like, oh, that's just JD advantage. It's like, okay, they're just shooting themselves in the foot, right? Okay, now, now, what's one of the, let's just go ahead and say, now, how many people know, like, Mark Galantry used to do, read all the sociology of law people used to do research on the legal profession? When you go to a country like Japan, where the bar pass rate historically, traditionally, was 1%, what do you call all the people working in the legal profession who never got admitted to the bar? Law workers. They have to be called something, right? Okay, let's call them law workers, okay? So, compliance people are quote unquote law workers because JD is not required, right? Okay, now, law workers are not they do not self-identify as lawyers, members of a traditional self-regulating profession. Now, one of the predictors of diffusion of innovation within an organization is whether or not the humans that are supposed to be internalizing the innovation self-designate as members of a traditional profession. If they self-designate as being accountants or lawyers, that is a barrier to the diffusion of innovation. Okay, so, so, so we're starting to have automation of compliance functions and augmenting the productivity of human workers with, with smart systems. 
The client staff do not self-designate as being members of a profession yet because it's brand new. They are embracing computers and, and artificial intelligence, machine learning technologies much more openly than the lawyer. Because the lawyers say like, I'm a lawyer, you don't get it. I'm right, you're wrong, that's the end of the discussion, right? The compliance people are in the corporate hierarchy. They have to play ball about the value proposition for the customer. They have to think about maximizing compliance outputs with the minimum of inputs. So computerization is their friend, okay? So according to my theory, according to my theory, the law workers in compliance are moving ahead integrating quote unquote thinking like a lawyer skills with computational thinking like how, how do I know what the computer is doing? What information do I need to call out from the computer? Right? How you can share responsibilities with the software and, and the software can be as transparent as possible so that you don't get like the Volkswagen problem, right? Okay, so, so I'm using, we were discussing computational thinking. Sure. So I'm using, my friends in computer science at the university level say, our friends in computer science now have decided that computer science is humanity. Because computational thinking is like thinking like a lawyer. It's a core dimension of critical thinking. It's like how we understand what the humans are doing and what the machines are doing, right? So, so if we could break down, instead of having this opaque, complex, synthetic blob of thinking like a lawyer, if we disaggregated it into modules, we've got a transition path for computer augmentation of law learning, law practice. Okay, so then, and, and let me tell you, how many people know the Supreme Court said that lawyers cannot stop Rocket Lawyer and LegalZoom? That was a Supreme Court decision last year. It's called the North Carolina Board of Dental Examiners. Because the dental examiners use the lawyer cease and desist letter. That's how we would get there. Okay. So, 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 citizens, how many, okay, how many people have read Clayton Christensen's, Clayton Christensen's uh, Innovator's Dilemma? Yeah, no, you don't have to read it. Just type in Clayton Christensen, Innovator Dilemma, PDF, and get the two-page summary. Okay, it's, it was published 20 years ago. So he asked the question, how do companies like Kodak, that had a reputation for a century of, of, of operational excellence and innovation, how do they just, like, implode, right? And the answer is, it's the dinosaurs versus the small furry rodents. The dinosaurs look down at the small furry rodents and say, they're not competing in the same market I am, right? It's like, that's not what I'm doing. I'm producing like really fine quality, you know, Kodachrome and, and, and Leica lenses and all that stuff, right? Okay, so, so the, um, the legal profession looks at LegalZoom and Rocket Lawyer and they say, look at those shitty digital cameras. Nobody would want those, right? But it's like, come on, like your iPhone today is better than the SLR camera you had when you were in college if you were a film buff, right? So, so what's happening is, the integration of machine learning, artificial intelligence, big data, cloud computing, in the practice of law, the, as far as I can tell, if lawyers don't get with the program, the main transition vector is gonna be through compliance. That this is happening, and it's happening fast. Now, think about, think, think about the compliance function. What do they need to do? They need to get every human in the organization to internalize compliance norms. What do we call that? Teaching people how to think like a lawyer. Once they got that worked out, it's like the original shitty first version of digital cameras. Right? Did everybody get it? Okay, so, so, so that's why I think compu I've come to the conclusion, like in the last week, that computational thinking is the answer. It's like if we don't embrace computational thinking as part of thinking like a lawyer, somebody else is going to do it. And, and as we say, that someone else will not be motivated by benevolence. Okay, uh, and then finally, if you break down the elements of legal reasoning, the ultimate beneficiaries are not the students and not the law firms, but the citizens. Okay, so, so how does this all work out? So, so, of course everybody's like pulling up the ladders like mad and saying, like, I'm good at this and this is why I went to law school and I don't want to change and stuff, right? So what's the solution if like the legal profession is shrinking and, and drawing the wagons, right? The underserved 70%. Lane Christensen published an article a couple of years ago about market creating innovation. 
How do you predict where a market that doesn't exist today will exist in the future? You look at cool stuff that rich people have that poor people aspirationally want. That's where the market's going to be created, right? Do you think that the poor would like to know their rights and exercise them? That's the solution, is lawyers need to be the facilitators of that empowerment. And then it's like the legal profession could expand instead of shrinking. Okay, now, so, and then finally, I have other hobbies. So, what if we had a standardized way of teaching people legal reasoning? What could you do with that? You could have high school legal reasoning. You could have college major in legal reasoning. Uh, I got a Fulbright. I'm going to be in China next year. But if I hadn't gone to China, I was going to start visiting one of the state prisons near University of Washington, seeing if I could teach people who are incarcerated to pass issue spotter exams. Right? Not to teach them how to write their jailhouse lawyer you know, petitions, but to help them understand in the background the skills that they need, right? So it's like, it's like this could just be like cool as hell, right? Okay, so anyway, that's, that's what I think. Okay, now, um, so one other question, I think this is my last slide. Okay, last slide, okay. So what I was gonna say is, how could there be a forum for getting people who think, like me, that first of all, I have guaranteed life and employment, I can't be fired, that's why I can do this as a hobby, right? Okay, so uh, the conflict of interest, in fact, should be resolved, okay? So what if we got together a bunch of people who just thought it would be fun to brainstorm about what we would call basic operations of legal reasoning and get as many people as possible in the debate, right? So I'm, so why am I a member of the board of Cali? Because I've been telling John Mayer that we need to do this in Cali for like the last 20 years, right? Okay, so you'd say like, well, it hasn't happened yet. Okay, so, okay, okay. So, so let's go ahead and concede Let's go ahead and concede that in the legal profession, people use social status as a proxy for competence, right? Because people can't actually measure competence directly. Okay, so who do we need to enlist? The old farts. We need to get the ALI to sponsor this. <laughs> right? Right? Because like, I don't know if you guys know this, do you know that ALI has a huge relevance problem? <laughs> right? It's just like, okay, this is like for players. I was invited to join the ALI 15 years ago as a diversity member, not for gender, for youth. <laughs> I'm not kidding, I was like 35 years old. The a when I joined the ALI 15 years ago, the average age of the ALI membership was like 78 years old. The f I only ever went to one annual meeting. It's not like this anymore. They've, they've, tr they've been working as fast as they can, as hard as they can to transform it. But when I went to my first and only ALI annual meeting, there were more people in the room in wheelchairs with nurses and oxygen tanks than with laptop computers. And I just thought, well, I just don't think I need to come to these annual meetings. Okay. So, so now if you went to the ALI, it looks more like the American Bar Association. It, it reproduces the diversity that we've achieved in the American Bar Association, which is not perfect, but it's like better than that, right? Okay. So, so the ALI needs hobbies. You know, we need hobbies, right? Okay. So anyway, so I'm saying is the end game would be to try and enlist the ALI or some organization like that that is respected, because the ABA is compromised because they're the accreditation authorities, right? So they've got a conflict of interest, right? But the ALI has no conflict of interest. And do you know some of the ALI projects? Do you know that they're doing whether or not, uh, uh, um, gosh, I'm not good at describing this. It's like no means no. They're trying to write a code for colleges on whether or not they need to turn over a complaint of like of misconduct of sexual assault to the police. Do you know that? So the ALI in the last five to ten years has started taking on extremely sensitive, extremely controversial projects. Their tolerance for controversy has gone up, right? So almost everyone thinks they've completely, totally screwed up that project. But but they're trying. They're trying to be relevant, right? Okay. So anyway, so that's that's what I think. Now, what's up on the website? If you go to the website, I've put up I didn't spend the whole time. I could, oh, I, I opened the PowerPoint. I opened the PDFs. Here, wait a minute. Where are they? Where did the PDFs go? I opened them. Is it here? Oh, here it is. Here, here. Okay, so if we look at this, this is, okay, so um, these are, I gave them a worked example before I asked them to do one. So I explained how perceptive works. I explained what they were going to be asked to do. And I gave them, I actually gave them an example. I gave them examples of student work and I showed how I would have graded it in perceptive. So I gave them worked examples to give them the, exam the idea. And then what we did, because now the thing I haven't figured out, perceptive is amazing, but I haven't figured out how to use it to train for the issue spotting. Like here's the fact pattern and you have 20 rules, which of the 20 rules? I haven't figured that out yet. 
So what we did is I gave them that theoretic question and we brainstormed in class and achieved consensus about where they should be with their answer, okay? So they knew the issue. So then I gave them, I went through and graded everything and then I turned them loose to grade it a second time but I gave them relatively detailed guidelines. So here it says, um, this is about you know the, the, how you assess, because the perceptive thing was designed for, lead, for writing, generic writing. It's not designed to assess mastery of content. So I'm using it in a hybrid sense. Like the people that are doing perceptive, it's like, huh. Like they don't know what to be. It's like, like whatever you want to do. Okay, so, so my use of perceptive is not 100% standard because it's got some content. So part of the scoring guidelines was to make sure that everybody understood the black letter law of the problem and how to apply it, okay? And the guys at Perceptive looked and they said, yeah, uh-huh. The first one was a little bit noisy, but the second, the second complete cycle, we got the right result, which is that the student results were statistically indistinguishable from my marking. So, that's my hope. <laughs> you can tell I've been same way in the spring because I wasn't ready to change gears and mm -hmm. do it differently. Um, well, well, see, what I would say is, 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 is I was down in the weeds with this, mm -hmm. and so let's go ahead and say what I said to you at the board meeting should have been interpreted as you're working on a different problem than I am, and we're both using the same words to describe it, and so it's confusing. But because I speak first and think second, I said, that's completely wrong. <laughs> So well, yeah, as you say that, I think that's probably right because I'm not working on. Uh, right. I was not trying to get students to, to stop the fundamentals and do the algebra and the trigon. I, I was already at the point where they were already presumptive I issue spotters, and so I was. Correct. And what I would say is, I think if we went to the vendor hall, that that's a very crowded market, and so the only reason I keep coming back to the idea that Cali could facilitate this dialogue, there's a, a principle which is basic research is not funded by commercial entities. It has to be funded by the federal government. Basic research in science is a public good. <coughs> and so if, this, if my hypothesis is that there's this lower level of modular units that make up these higher level complex skills, that's basic research and no one has a business model to do it on a for-profit basis. What you're doing is actually very mature and the, the commercial bar review people are doing it. And so you might have a system that's better than the commercial bar reviews or it might be equipped. You know, we could do a randomized control test of your system and the bar review <coughs> the theme. You see what I mean? So what you're doing is, is, is I think it's a much more mature thing. And of course it's valuable and helpful to the students. Of course it is. Compared to no feedback, of course it's helpful. Yeah. Sorry. Somebody else? Yeah. So this is a very elementary question. I was impressed that your first sales class, the median was like 68. It strikes me as suggesting <laughs> that you're getting through to more students, even though their, their quality was the same. You know, All right, the admissions process, let's go ahead and say, we can, let's just as a working hypothesis, let's say that, that both classes were actually a statistically random sample of students admitted to the job, and there was no variation in our admissions. Okay, 
So if you look at, I think that James Sirwicky article is just like mind blowing because the example he gives, and I'm like, I can't remember. It's like, oh gosh, it was the guy. It was like 30 years ago, and Kermit, Kermit Washington, in basketball. Do people remember? Yeah, they hit. Yeah, yeah. Okay, see, it's like I'm clueless about sports. Okay, so so after that, he nearly got bounced from the NBA, right? He hired a coach, and he worked with the coach, and he went in 10 years from nearly being kicked out of the NBA to being the most valuable player. And as he started that meteoric rise, other players said, like, what's the contact information for your coach? <laughs> and it began to diffuse. And before that, Sir Wiki reports, I'm not a sports person, I don't know, everybody thought your ability to play basketball is a function of natural aptitude and when the team practices, they're coordinating as a team. They're not doing the 10,000 targeted practice thing, right? So what's happened in performance, so he said one of the examples he gives is the Van Cliburn piano competition. Compared to 30 years ago, if you listen to those recordings, there's huge variations. Today, they're all at the top. They're all at the upper level of what human capacity can do in terms of performance music, right? And so, so what I was observing is that at my institution, we appear to have a culture of social promotion. Uh, the grading curve goes from A to B, and there's a lot of students being moved forward at the B level, and they're, so they're not even getting the kind of feedback that Patrick is talking about, because they're, it's like they're just getting no feedback. They see their grades, they feel disappointed, they become alienated, they withdraw. Does that make sense? So that's how I interpret that is that they're just muddling through, they don't know what they're doing right, they don't know what they're doing wrong, they don't know who to ask for help. Now, University of Washington Law School is in the top quarter of US News and World Report. And so our academic support program does not look like academic support programs at other law schools. I won't go into it any more than that. Many law schools would not see what I saw. You see how the students that are bumping along the bottom of our class receive less support than students in third and fourth quartile law schools? So that's what you're seeing is that, is that there's a breakdown in the institutional process at my law school, and even just like one simple change like adopting perceptive could help stabilize that and get the students a little bit closer to where they need to be. That's, does that make sense? That's very interesting. Okay. I, I really like a lot of what you're talking about, uh, your title, from knowing what, to, or knowing that to knowing how. Because one of the things that I've grown convinced of is that we don't, we don't transparently separate the substantive law from the how to think of be, be a lawyer. And really, and what I tell my students every day is that the, the transcript says contracts, torts, property, whatever, but that's just because the register can't fit on there how to learn to think and act like a lawyer using. And I don't really care what the using is. They all, though, and this is part of what I get to, their concept is that's what you say on my classes, that's what I'm learning, and that's part of the disconnect, so I'll say come by and talk tomorrow at 10.30 with me about this. But um, I have a, a summer program, incoming students, where we literally transparently break it down. And my problem is that I have to remember how basic you have to get to a first year law student, because we've been doing it a while. And you have to go back to simple things like, right, they have no idea what a 12B6 is. They have no idea what the word demur means. They have no idea what, all of it. And so it's, it takes me you know, four times longer to do anything. On the other hand, I teach it in the summer, and rather than 2,100 minutes, I do 4,000 minutes, so I have the time to do it. Mm -hmm. But that's the other thing I do, is I just well, see, what I would say, right, see, so what I would say is we're standing on the threshold of like industrialized legal education, which is like, is like law schools across the country internally have their own little local culture. So your local culture might be your class or schools that have a really good orientation program. They might have everybody on board for the orientation program. Schools that integrate the orientation program into the whole curriculum then they would have the whole, you know, there's schools, I, I feel confident that there are law schools in this country that have the second and third year faculty members understanding concretely what's been covered in the first year and hooking into it better, right? Because, because the tradition in the more elite law schools is everything functions like in, you know, each class is out target, right? Okay, so, so part of what I think is, is that there's, there's knowledge, local knowledge everywhere, and what we need to do is distill it 
into something that everybody can like tolerate. None of it's perfect. Standards are never perfect. They're like lowest common denominator or something, right? But at least it would be like like a basic framework that that for schools like the University of Washington that hasn't shown any inclination to develop its own bespoke version, all the people with bespoke versions could get together in the room and debate what it means to teach thinking like a lawyer in a totally transparent way. And then you can develop teaching materials, like Cali lessons, so that you wouldn't have to get down there in the weeds on every, you see what I mean? It's like once we standardize, then you can populate a whole curriculum that can be delivered in a variety of ways. So that's what I'm hoping, so I don't know. Okay, so you want to hear something really, and then we'll go, because it's like we're already been over. Okay, so we got an email list, and we were trying to discuss these things, and guess what happened? I just annoyed the hell out of everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so, so like I'm slowly getting more coherent. It's like the dialogue that we had on the email list helped me to understand better why I think perceptive is so important. But the email list like broke down and is no longer being continued. So is there anything, like if anybody has any idea about like follow-up, like we could start another second email list and I could promise to keep my mouth shut more. <laughs> I don't know. I personally would like there to be some sort of additional discussion. Yeah, okay, okay, so, so I'm talking about, so what's your name? What's your name? Gary Sellis. Gary Sellis, Gary Sellis. okay, and your name is? Ann Johnson. Ann Johnson, okay, so like the three of us can meet afterwards? Okay. Woohoo. 2.0. Yay, 2.0. Okay, so thank you for coming.
Oh, so and, and Irish Hebrew so? is not a Kelly. I don't know. I'll be honest. I don't know all the professors yet. Yeah, 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 I was going to say, let's find out what it is.
the stems of that exactly. particle would write their own software to interface with the engine, right? Wow. Okay, so DOS, right? DOS no, no. is the well. Right, this is, but this is what, this is what they say, they say but, but, the, but the interface is so much better than it used to be. Okay. So anyway, so what he said is he's a marine biology teacher, and he was trying to get this so that students give each other feedback on their lab reports, the text part of their lab report, and he said it's transformative. He said, like, there's lab reports he gets now compared to what he's As I was person pointed out the statistics, I thought they were pretty really dramatic. Mm -hmm. So I, as soon as I saw those numbers, I thought I really need to take a look at this. Yeah, and so just, just look at those PDFs that I've uploaded to it's, it's in the Cali Conference. Oh, 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 but I don't want to crane my neck, so I'm going to go back here where I can directly at Yeah, or you can go watch another presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet you as well. So, yes, you can see. Excellent. Thank you. Bye. Which one is this one? is advanced legal writing using WordPress. Oh, I gotta get to the pipe for I'll be back. We won't start until 2.30. <laughs> hey, how are you? Hey, I'm good. Good to see you. I'm not presenting on WordPress this year, so I'm glad you are. Yeah, but, the, but now I'm nervous. <laughs> this is an actual WordPress expert. Oh, this is Jennifer hey. Roman, who's a professor over here. WordPress at consumer and user. <laughs> are you um, aware of um, WP Campus and the WordPress um, conference for higher education. Uh, no, uh, but I was I was thinking you were going to talk about WordCamp, like the just have one here in Atlanta. Yeah, but. I mean I I'm on the organizing committee for WordCamp Chicago, which is why my computer is covered in stuff <laughs> WordPress related. But um, yeah, they actually have a higher ed camp that's just for WordPress, and I think they're going to be streaming a lot of stuff. So that's nice. Matters, really. Um, they have a survey out that those of you that use this might want to contribute to because if you answer the survey, it gets kind of intensive because it's intended for people who are on the IT side or on the faculty side, whichever. I'm in between because I'm in the library. Um, but if you fill out the survey, you'll get the data back. They're going to give everybody the data set from everyone who contributes to it, which could be extremely valuable for making arguments about how other people are using it and why it could be valuable. I mean, it already runs, you know, almost 25% of the web, so that's right. pretty easy. Right. Hey, guys, like, if I teach a student how to use this, that's a good thing. <laughs> but Good Lord, these are high-resolution high projectors. Rich was saying that, but he wasn't kidding. We're used to teaching on a 1024 by 768 <laughs> projector because... Look at this room this very good at five presentations. Uh, people could read all of them and learn nothing. <laughs> Cool that is. Yeah, but no. sort of cool. But it's wait, are we gonna we're gonna run up here? So. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> this like, is look all. Look how cool it's totally two separate things. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> I 
might actually see Deb more often for the staff committee. Someone has a comment to review. And, um, <laughs> 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 